Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Uh, I'm grateful to be here. It's not snowing. That's a big plus for us Northeasterners. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about something uh, that, truth be told, I don't know very much about. Um, I know this may seem a little odd, uh, having a speaker who doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, to make matters worse, um, my ignorance is not for a lack of trying. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, the brain, is something uh, that I've studied for all of my adult life. Um, and given my age, that's the vast majority of my life. Uh, and in fact, uh, I study it because it's so uh, difficult to understand. Um, and I am not going to provide you with a deep insight today, uh, but at least perhaps give you a sense of why a deep insight is so hard to get. Um, and I'd like to start, actually, uh, by showing you uh, some data that came from uh, YouTube, great place to find things. I'm going to show you three short movies uh, that uh, highlight the issue uh, that has bedeviled me uh, since I was a graduate student. And it's basically the fact that uh, brains become ingrained uh, to do things quite well, uh, but there's a certain amount of solidness or calcification or lack of uh, changeability uh, once these things are set and in, become ingrained. Uh, and I want to give you a sense of this. Rather than talking about this, I'll just show you these three uh, YouTube videos. The first one's about uh, motor systems, about how we learn to do particular things. The second one is a classic uh, sensory system one. And the third is a little odd one about how you can't really trust one sense, like your hearing, if another sense, like your uh, sight, is telling you something that's at odds with it. So let's start with the first uh, video. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> All right, I'm sick. All right, so, uh, whatever you're in. Yeah. Wait, wait. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. Dude, look. All right, let's get together. 
Just give me that. Wait, wait, wait. Like, you gotta start rolling at least. Okay, go. And go. Oh, God! Alright, back up. Okay, wait. Keep your feet on the pedal. Go. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. <laughs> so here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards, it's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned all right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> yes. Got it, got it, got it. Yes, yes, I'm back. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, click, click. Hold it, click. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Good. Okay, I can run a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. Yeah. You think I'm faking? You don't believe me. That looks so weird to be like, la, 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 and it's full. You think I'm lying, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I don't. I'm not lying. <laughs> I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Okay. So let's this is the hollow head. This, Actually, at the moment, it's a perfectly Barbara normal Gregory. head of Charlie Chaplin. But wait, as it comes round, you'll see, or will you, that it's hollow. The back of it coming round now is actually a hollow mask. It appears to rotate in the opposite direction. And amazingly, the nose sticks out, although it's actually sticking in. Coming round now is the normal, correct as it were, face. And wait again as it comes round. And you'll see this extraordinary thing like Jekyll and Hyde.
both the noses stick out because it's so unlikely that a nose sticks in, that a face is hollow. So you see it as convex, although it's in fact concave, as now, and then it'll become the normal face again, there. And note that as soon as the features appear in the hollow inside, it will look convex, as though it's a normal face almost, though it isn't. As soon as the features appear, there, your brain refuses to see it as hollow, simply because it is so unlikely. And this demonstrates the immense power of top-down knowledge, which will actually counter signals, bottom up from the senses, and force an extraordinary illusion in which the sensory information of the present is cancelled by immense knowledge derived from the past, because you've seen so many faces, or with their noses sticking out. So it's just impossible to see that as correctly hollow. OK, so we have one more. And this one is called the McGurk effect. It's a very famous um, psychological phenomenon. Um, you're going to hear a person say, what a sheep says, ba. The sheep say ba. Lambs, ba. That's all that's, that's, all that's going to be said is ba. But um, I think you will find it very hard to hear it as ba when you um, watch this. And if at any time you think that it's another sound, just close your eyes. And you'll hear it's just ba. And there is one, the final part of it is the same person is, there are three pictures of him. And w depending on which one you look at, it'll sound different. Weird. So you can't even trust your ears, the McGurk effect. things talk to a kind of ingrainedness that somehow, despite your rational brain, you cannot overcome these illusions or these ways of doing things, whether it's motor or sensory, it's the same. And this implies that once you get a learned association, perhaps, between the shape of the lips and tongue and a sound, um, it's just hardwired hardwired. We, we talk about this, I'm sure you've heard this term, maybe we're hardwired, uh, maybe like a radio is soldered and hardwired. I want to go back to why neurobiologists uh, think that this word hardwired is not actually a bad uh, word to think about this, because the brain actually is made up of wires, and this was the great discovery of the father maybe we could say the mother of neurobiology, but it was a man, so we should say it's the father of neurobiology, Ramoni Cajal, Santiago Ramoni Cajal. And I want to go back to uh, the origins of neuroscience. Uh, he was born in 1852, did most of his work in the late 1800s, continued to be productive afterwards, but his great discoveries were done in the 1890s. Uh, and he was a remarkable guy. He, he wanted to be an artist. His father uh, insisted he be pre-med. Uh, they fought over it, but his father won. Uh, and then he ended up going to medical school, but uh, decided that the thing he liked to do most was draw. So he became an illustrator for pathologists 
and then somebody showed him a Golgi stain. I'll explain what that is in a second, which is a stain of the brain, and that just changed his life course. And all these chemicals here and all these microscopes were him uh, modifying the Golgi stain in order to see brain tissue. So he's a Spaniard, and Golgi was an Italian uh, scientist. Golgi is a very famous histologist. You may have heard of the Golgi tendon organ, um, Golgi apparatus. There are a whole bunch of things inside animals and humans that are named after Golgi. And one of the things he did, uh, apparently in his kitchen, was playing while he was playing around with photographic uh, emulsion uh, materials, he was trying to see if he could get a stain for tissue uh, that took advantage of the way silver stains worked in photography. And he mixed together two different salts, sodium nitrate and potassium dichromate, in just the right way that he got a very, very inefficient label of the brain. Inefficient in the sense that the vast majority of brain cells were not labeled at all. But any cell that had a crystal of silver dichromate in it, that was a nidus for crystallization. And that crystal would fill up the entire cell, but not cross the relatively hydrophobic membranes. So you could just get a whole cell completely filled. It was a very unlikely event that this crystal would form at all. So maybe 1 to 5% of the cells would label and they would just label randomly, and everything else was unlabeled. And so for the first time, it was possible to see individual nerve cells intact from beginning to end, all their processes. And you may know nerve cells are very complicated. They're not just little cells. They're cells, but they have all these wires sticking out of them. And Golgi uh, generated this remarkable tool that allowed you to see these individual cells. He was no match, though, for Cajal, who was a visual genius and uh, looked at this material and began to infer things about uh, the way the brain was organized that uh, Golgi himself thought were crazy ideas. And they shared the Nobel Prize, uh, Golgi for the Golgi stain and Cajal for what he did with the Golgi stain. And it's uh, kind of interesting to listen to or read the Golgi Nobel lecture in 1906, I think, uh, where he's standing next to Cajal and his whole lecture is uh, basically saying that Cajal is an idiot, that he completely misunderstood the Golgi stain. And he turned out uh, to be largely incorrect about that, <laughs> so it was unfortunate. Uh, but Cajal saw many wonderful things. Uh, he was a great neuroanatomist, an extraordinarily hard worker. Uh, and I'll show you the essence of what he found. He found that the nerve cells are not only do they have these wires, but the wires can be divided into two types, dendrites that receive information and axons that send information, and that nerve cells are connected together in a directional network. And here's the kind of drawing he made. So this is a, a drawing. It's not his most impressive drawing. There's actually an art exhibit of his work uh, traveling through the country right now. Truly remarkable, beautiful to see his work. This is a, a little piece of a drawing he made of the cerebral cortex of a cat. And uh, the paper has yellowed, uh, but he did used whiteout uh, to correct little errors that no one else would probably even have noticed. Uh, but the whiteout stood the test of time much better than the paper. So this has this kind of look like snow on trees, but that's completely accidental. Uh, but what really is special about this picture, these are nerve cells. This little thing in the middle of each of them is a nucleus, um, is these arrows. <clears throat> so this is what Cajal said. Cajal's big idea was that axons, so this is an axon of a nerve cell that's somewhere over here, let's say, and it sends a branch, an axonal branch, that terminates in a bunch of little branches that overlap the shorter, stubbier branches of this neuron. Those branches are dendrites. And he claimed that at the uh, juxtaposition of axons and dendrites, some kind of information left the axon, jumped into the dendrites, flowed into the cell body of the cell, and then was sent out the axon of this cell. See this arrow here? And that axon would overlap the dendrites of another cell. This is a pyramidal cell in the cortex. This triangular shape is, makes it called a pyramidal cell. 
And that information would then flow down this apical dendrite into the cell body. And here's another axon that's contacting the more basal dendritic branches of the same cell. And together, those inputs collaborate in some way to generate a signal that leaves this cell out its axon. Notice the arrows. This axon then touches the apical dendrite of this neuron. That information flows to the cell body and out that axon. And this axon does the same thing over here. And here in one fell swoop, without ever knowing what a synapse is, this is before synapses or how electrical currents flow through nerve cells, which was not yet known, just from dead material stained with the Golgi stain, he, he inferred a kind of directional network, which to this day is the standard accepted notion of the way information flows uh, through nerve cells. Um, he didn't know about things like inhibition, which is a very uh, interesting fact that not every axon is trying to make the cell send information. Some axons, uh, for example, the axon going up in the cortex like this is almost certainly an inhibitory axon. It's not trying to send information that goes down. It's trying, trying to shut down information of other axons that might be uh, contacting these same dendrites. He didn't know about that. So you know, one has to fault him that he didn't know everything. But how could he possibly know that from a Golgi stain anyway? But he was uh, aware that there were things he didn't understand. He had just a, a remarkably insightful idea. And to this day, most of us, when we think about neural circuits, we draw them uh, this kind of way, although this is based on a very sparse labeling. There's probably 1,000 cells in this area and hundreds of thousands of axons coming in, which you don't see in this picture because it's a Golgi stain. But this is uh, generally the way we accept things to be. And this big idea had a big implication. And the big implication was the implication for behavior, which is that it actually is a wiring diagram. If you, for example, uh, activate the skin, so here's an axon that uh, is making contact with the skin. Let's say you uh, stick a needle into the skin. Uh, that information would flow into the spinal cord. And some of the branches of that axon will touch the dendrites of a cell, maybe in the thalamus. That cell will send an axon up into the cerebral cortex, where it will touch the dendrites of a pyramidal neuron. That neuron will then send that information back down to the spinal cord, where it will touch the dendrites of a motor neuron in the spinal cord. A motor neuron makes synapses on muscle fibers. And so if you get stuck with a pin or you step on a pin, you're going to lift your leg uh, because of a reflex like this. Similarly, you could imagine that if you're driving a car, you're driving along and suddenly a red light appears, uh, you suddenly move your leg muscles to push on the brake. And if a green light appears, you move your leg muscles to push on the gas. This would be, again, a wiring diagram basis for that, that there is sort of a connectional map that, that allows you to do these things. And of course, you don't have a genetic basis for stepping on the brake when there's a red light. This had to have been learned. So this wiring diagram to do something like stepping on the brake when you see a red light or stepping on the gas when you see a green light would have to mean that this wiring diagram was instantiated instantiated based on experience. So that's the big idea. But if one wants to actually see if this theory has any legs, you'd actually have to be able to do this kind of tracing. And truth be told, no one has been able to do anything uh, this big at all, not even close. It's very difficult to do this. And one of the things that's problematic about the Golgi stain is that very, very few cells label. And they're not the opportune cells. It's just random cells that label. And we thought maybe one way we could get the entire network of what is going on is to label all the cells. Now, if the Golgi stain labeled all the cells, that would be not very useful, because it'd just be a big brown mass. They'd just be label everywhere. So what you would want is some way of seeing every single cell as an individual without having the problem of ambiguity of whether the process is coming from one cell or another. So how might we see every individual cell as a single cellular entity? The way we thought about this was color. Maybe we could make a technicolor Golgi, where instead of just having sparse labeling with this brown label, maybe every cell could be labeled, but each a different color. 
That was the idea. And I will make a long story short, saying that we did something that uh, I think to people who are not expert in the field may seem a little odd, but uh, is now quite uh, unremarkable, which is we used our brains to make a new kind of mouse. This is not a mouse that evolved through natural selection. It's a mouse that evolved through cognitive decisions of human beings. Human beings have created organisms that have special features. And in this case, we took advantage of the fact that there are proteins in jellyfish and in corals that are fluorescent. And those proteins have genes that make those fluorescent colors. And we could take those genes out of jellyfish and out of corals and transgenically engineer mice that now express color inside the nervous system. This would never happen naturally. There's no way a jellyfish would have sex with a mouse. It would just never, ever happen. But humans can do this quite easily. And then the way we got a lot of color is that we had a red fluorescent protein, a green fluorescent protein, and a blue fluorescent protein. And we only have three photoreceptors, uh, red, green, and blue preferring, preferring photoreceptors. Every color we see is basically a mixture of how much red, how much green, and how much blue comes back from a particular place in the world. So what we did was we made transgenic mouse with a random amount of red, green, and blue in each nerve cell. And this is an example of one of these brainbow mice. This is the hippocampus, and this is the cerebral cortex. All of these things here are nerve cells, and there's lots of color here. And we gave this, this name brainbow. Uh, you know, scientists are not that funny, so it's not that funny a name, but uh, it, it always, scientists at least laugh at it. I think, oh, it's clever. It's not that clever. It's, it, but, but that's what we call it, brainbow. Uh, and I'll just zoom up on this little part here. If the lights were down a little bit, I think you'd get a better impression. But I think you can see there's lots of color here. Uh, and it's really quite beautiful to look at brains this way. Uh, I'm going to show you one place where we found we could use this to great advantage, which was by getting these colors to be generated, not in every cell in the brain, but specifically in the cells in the spinal cord that go to muscle fibers. So the spinal cord sort of is a butterfly shape. And the cells at the very bottom of this butterfly, in the anterior horn, as it's called, the ventral horn of the uh, spinal cord, these are the motor neurons who send axons out of the brain and innervate, contact those muscle fibers that I showed you that diagram from Cajal of. So if you take this uh, animal and trace out the peripheral branch uh, through the, what's called the ventral nerve root all the way out into a limb, you have these very long nerves where all the axons are uh, different colors. And when I saw this, I was really overwhelmingly happy. I realized we had built a remarkably powerful tool to trace wires very long distances. Uh, and I was really patting myself on the back a lot until uh, an engineer friend of mine reminded me that if you open up any computer, you will find that they figured this out a long, long time ago, that if you want to trace wires a long way, uh, you just color code them. And so this is very much like this. Uh, and it is a form, interestingly, of convergent evolution, where <laughs> we're making animals now that have the same property as the inside of computers. Weird. Uh, yeah, weird. Anyway, if you look at this at higher power using a confocal microscope, See, the colors are beautiful. They really are great. And then if you trace these wires into muscle, you can then see which particular muscle fiber is contacted by each of these different axons, which each come from a different neuron, because they're different colors. Uh, and this is an example of looking in a muscle. It'll take a second for the memory to catch up here. And then it should play smoothly, I hope. Uh, what you're seeing here are the ends of those axons. And they end in these things that look like pretzels. And if you look carefully, these pretzels look like they're clasping cylinders. And the reason they do is that there's muscle fibers running this way. 
And each muscle fiber has a neuromuscular junction, a place where an axon from a motor neuron makes a connection with the muscle fiber to make it contract. And if you trace along, you'll have to trust me on this, you trace along a single muscle fiber, there's only one neuromuscular junction on a muscle fiber, only one. And uh, not only is there only one site, but there's only one axon at each of these sites. But the same axon can go to different muscle fibers. So for example, these two adjacent muscle fibers happen to be contacted by the same axon. But this is a different neuron, that's a different neuron, that's a different neuron. All these colors tell you that there's a lot of neurons here. And this allowed us for the first time to map out every single axon that goes to a muscle. And I'm gonna show you uh, the result of this now. I have to, it has to pause a second because this is very large data. Here's one of these axons that go to a muscle that pulls the ear back in a mouse. It's called the interscutellaris muscle. And each of these is one of those neuromuscular junctions. So here's an axon in an adult mouse. That's one axon. And here's another axon in the same muscle. And here's another one in the same muscle. Now you notice I'm putting them in one at a time. This is because I have a contract with Ju Lu, who was the graduate student who did this, that whenever I show this, I have to show them one at a time because it took so much work to trace all this <laughs> that if I just show it all at once, it will demean the amount of extraordinary effort it took to get this uh, done. But I'm gonna put them in one at a time. And you may be worried, how long is this gonna go on? There are only 15 axons altogether, so we're already more than halfway. But I, I'm, I have a contract with him, I cannot, I cannot change this, I have to go. Some of them have a lot of branches, and you see now we're getting ones that are sparser, but they're distributed in some weird, weird way, not in an obvious way. And so we not only did the left ear, but we did the right ear of the same mouse. Mice are very symmetric. And we did that in uh, six animals. And it turned out that every one of these branching patterns, which we call a connectome, was unique. Every one, the wiring diagram, was different from every other one. And this speaks to the question about what are we going to learn from wiring diagrams if every one is different from every other one, something that keeps me up at night. Um, and there was something else about this that was shocking to me. There was a lot of suboptimality, useless loops, premature branching. I'll show you an example. So here's one of those uh, connectomes that Zhu Lu did. Uh, and all the axons have been labeled blue here so they don't confuse us. And only one axon is labeled red. And this little box here is blown up here. All of the axons, except for two, go this way. One of them, this blue one that goes up here, is a branch that goes both directions. And this red one is the only axon in this particular animal that just went this way. Now, th that, who am I to judge? It seems, okay, per perfectly fine, except for the fact that it makes a hairpin turn here and goes all the way back down here and then goes out again. So that seems, I wouldn't have done it that way. I mean, here, for example, is a neuromuscular junction. There's only one neuromuscular junction of this axon down in this part of the muscle. There was an easy way to get there. You just make a little branch like this. But no, it does this extraordinarily circuitous route. But that's not the worst of it. Here's the bad one. This neuromuscular junction is based on a branch at, right at this point. So it's fine, you branch here and you should send a branch there, but that's not what happens. It branches here and both branches go all the way up here and then one branch peels off, crosses over itself to make that neuromuscular junction. So we see lots of stuff like this. It's not perfect. And when you look in insect nervous systems and you look in worm nervous systems, you never see stuff like this. But in our mammalian nervous system, it's messy and it's not stereotyped. So what is that telling us? Where does all this variability come from? And the answer is from development. This is an adult axon making a bunch of neuromuscular junctions in a muscle. This is a different muscle, not the interscutellaris, but a little neck muscle. It makes about 15 neuromuscular junctions. It's a two-week-old mouse. We did the same experiment of looking at a single axon at birth. 
And here's what this kind of axon looks like at birth. A hell of a lot more branches. In fact, every one of these gray sites is a neuromuscular junction. This one axon contacts 85% of all the neuromuscular junctions here, whereas two weeks later, it only contacts 5%. So there's a massive, massive amount of branches here that disappear over age. And you know, we did this with many different samples. And we could count the number of muscle fibers in a motor unit. That's what this is called. And at birth, it's about 12 times bigger than the adult. And it's biggest at birth. And then, as you can see, when it comes to the brain's wiring, at least of muscle, it's all downhill after birth. You start out complicated, and you end up simple. That would be kind of the backwards of what I would have thought, I guess. I think a, an adult is really super smart and has all these ideas and must have a very complicated wiring diagram. A baby can't even turn over. I mean, it's just a blob of protoplasm. It shouldn't have anything. And it's just the opposite. The baby's brain, is, or at least the muscle, is extremely complicated at birth and simple later on. Now, this also infers something. There's another inference you can make here. Because this is one axon in each case, if this one axon innervates 85% of the muscle fibers, then if every axon is doing this, there must be multiple axons converging at each of these neuromuscular junctions. Whereas there's only one axon at each of these in the adult, there should be multiple ones here. And to see if that was true, that would be the expectation here, we had to use a technique that I'm going to speak a lot about in a few minutes of serial electron microscopy, where we take image after image of a neuromuscular junction in this case and stack them up, align them. There's the muscle fiber striations. And then see how many axons are going to that one neuromuscular junction. And it's amazing. There is not one axon. There's not two axons. There's a whole bunch of axons. Virtually every axon in the muscle is going to that one muscle fiber. So this is one neuromuscular junction. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a very weak nine, a weaker 10, and one that looks like it's already on the way out, 11 an extraordinary amount of convergence. And also, each of those axons had an extraordinary amount of divergence at birth. Now, if you wait a week, at two weeks, there's only one axon left. If you wait a week, then most neuromuscular junctions only have two inputs. And at that point, we could actually do time-lapse imaging. So here is a neuromuscular junction from a postnatal day seven animal, where one axon has the left side of the synapse, and the other axon has the right size. They kind of, at some places, they're sort of squaring off. And they're in competition to see who will survive. And then we just followed this over time. So we would take a picture, in this case, at postnatal day 11. The yellow axon looks like it's at a slight disadvantage compared to the blue. We took this picture, sewed up the wound, came back, looked at the animal, re-anesthetized the baby mouse pup at postnatal day 12. And then you can see yellow has gained a little and blue has lost a little. Did the same thing at postnatal day 13. Yellow has gained more, blue has lost more. Postnatal day 14, there's only yellow there. Postnatal day 15, it kind of plumps up. So finally, one axon becomes victorious by invading the territory of the competitor, which is eliminated. We call this synapse elimination. Peace then reigns for most of the rest of the life of the animal. You can just come back. Week after week, and it's very boring. Nothing happens anymore. Uh, and you have now a monogamous relationship in muscle where one axon and one target cell are coupled, and they remain coupled like that until late in old age when one or the other dies. And then they have to find new, new mates. But for most of the life, they're together. So, and you, these, this analogy, which sounds very uh, sort of odd, I think you must remember that everything humans do, we do because our neurons are telling us to do those things. Just like a country behaves like the people in the country to some degree, I think humans behave in some ways because this is what's going on inside. 
we have this period in early life where we're trying out lots of targets, we're trying out lots of ideas, and then we eliminate a lot and we end up being boring adults. At least that's what my children tell me about me. So here is a summary of this. At birth, you have this very complicated all-to-all -all connectivity. Each axon goes to many muscle fibers. Each muscle fiber is contacted by many or mo most of the axons. And then you have this remarkable amount of synapse elimination and pruning, where each axon ends up being the sole proprietor of a series of muscle fibers that are random relative to another instantiation of this same event. So what could be going on during this period that could be of value to teach how it should wire up. And I'm going to show one more movie, um, which is a movie of what is happening to human kids before they're walking. And again, they're blobs of protoplasm. But if you speed them up and you watch what goes on, you see they're doing a lot of work that seems almost insanely uh, purposeful. So here is an example of a four-hour time lapse of a nine-month-old baby. And uh, I'll let it speak for itself. on, I think, is we are making a lot of these wires. So the implications of the profound, uh, of the profound rewiring theory, this is as close as I get to theory, is maybe mature circuits of nerve cells, not just muscle is the question, emerge after a period of pruning from a much more interconnected nervous system of juveniles. Pruning is mediated by neural activity, sensory experience, and motor practice that causes synapse elimination we become what we become based on what remains after pruning. Start out with the potential to be many things, but we end up as a small subset of these. I am a professor, a teacher, and it has, not, it has crossed my mind that education in this sense is destructive, destroying potential by giving you the dogmatic line if I impress any young people here today, I may be eliminating some alternative ways of thinking about the world. And that's, um, it's, I don't know if that's good or bad. That, that's what, is, what happens. And certainly you feel, I'm sure when you talk to your parents, if you're young, 
that they seem a little more narrow-minded than you are. And I know I'm not narrow-minded, but my <laughs> children think I am. And I remember thinking that of my parents, so it's a real paradox. I don't quite get how this works. So could it be uh, that the same thing is going on in mu that is going on in muscle is also happening in the brain? This is the big question, and I wish I could give you an answer. Uh, what we've been trying to figure out is how to ask that question. Uh, are we instantiating memories by sculpting neural circuits via the process of synapse elimination? It's a big idea. I have warned people in my lab, if you have an idea that makes sense to you, almost certainly it's wrong. So I do understand that. But let me just tell you how we're going about this. We are uh, trying to do the equivalent of Brainbow, but we can't use optical light techniques because the resolution limit of the light microscope is too big. We need higher resolution, and electron microscopy does this. So two people uh, who worked with me, Ken Hayworth and Richard Schleck, Richard is still in the lab, Ken is now at Genalia Farm, uh, built a machine uh, that allows us to automatically generate a film strip of brain tissue, a film strip. And this is the film here, and that is the brain. And I'll explain, this is just, although it looks like a movie projector, it's actually making a movie. It's making a film strip of sections. And let me just explain how that happens. We take a piece of brain and we slice it against a diamond knife. There's a water boat here. The sections float in the water boat. And then a conveyor belt picks one up after another. And here's a little movie of that process going on there. So we're cutting a piece of brain very thin, 30 nanometers thick. That's a thousandth as thick as a hair. So they're very thin. They float into water, and then this conveyor belt, you can see the sections here, are marching up on this very thick carbon-coated Capcom polyimide tape. So we're getting a big tape, and we can get about 10,000 sections, each 30 nanometers thick per day. All automatic, this runs all day, all night, Christmas Eve, Sunday, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, the only thing every once in a while it requests is oil, which we're happy to give it. And then we take the tape, we cut it into strips, and we put them on wafers, and then we image the wafers in an electron microscope. So here, Bobby Kasturi, who developed the way of imaging it with scanning electron microscopy, is holding his hand very still so we can see what these sections look like. Uh, and here is a section of cerebral cortex and hippocampus, the place that I showed you the brain bow from. This is the same kind of thing, but now in the electron microscope. He's holding his breath now going into the electron microscope. Uh, those are blood vessels. These big white objects are nerve cells. These white stripes are the apical dendrites of neurons. These black outlined objects are myelinated axons. These dark objects here are mitochondria inside cells. If we zoom up enough, finally you can see a cross-section of an axon filled with these little freckles, these synaptic vesicles that can chain neurotransmitter up against a dendritic spine. So let me just... Uh, label this for you. This is a dendrite from a neuron, and neuron dendrites have spines, the little thin necks, spine apparatus, and a fat bulb at the end, and that spine is juxtaposed to an axon. This is a cross-section, 30 nanometers thick, and the axon is releasing synaptic vesicle contents right at a synaptic cleft. So this is the synapse. So great, we can see all this. Really, that's the good news. The bad news is here. This is the image, and that is what I just showed you. So this is huge. This is one by one millimeter. So it's not that big. Uh, and in fact, just to get this whole thing at that resolution requires us to take one, two, three, four, five, six, 30 images. And each of those, because the field of view of the electron microscope is, is, is only about that big, so you have to take 30 images, and this image itself took five hours to take that image. And we were doing five million pixels per second, so it's not like we were going slow, but still it took a long time. And when we're done with those five hours, we have now an image at high resolution of something that big. And that's one square millimeter. Uh, let's say we wanted to also go a millimeter in depth to get a cubic millimeter. We would have to do that 33,300 and 33 times, and each of them took five hours. I did the math. 
many, many times. I did it over and over again, trying to hope that I had made a mistake. But at that imaging rate, a cubic millimeter takes 17 years. And, you know, I can't get any graduate students to do this one. <laughs> Postdocs are happy to do this because they've got a job. But graduate students don't want to take that long for their PhD. So we have to figure out a way to go faster. And I wouldn't be saying this if there wasn't a way. And so instead of 17 years, we can now do this in six months. And this is the reason uh, we partnered with this company to uh, build a machine that would do this. And that made me very happy, but not completely happy and for two reasons. One is I'm standing on a chair <laughs> with wheels. This is, it looks like a refrigerator, but it's a refrigerator for giants. It's, it's about 10 feet tall. Uh, it's also called the Multisem 505. That 505 gives you the impression that, you know, they've been making these a long time. This is the Multisem point zero zero one. This is the very first one they made. And that 505 was just there to make me feel better. Uh, and it took a while before it was running, but now it's running very nicely. It's a very strange machine. It's very fast. It's probably the fastest electron microscope ever built. It generates 11, 12 terabytes a day. Probably we'll be able to double that at some point. Um, and it was designed for connectomics. It's an interesting machine. The reason it goes so fast is that, remember, I had to take each of those images one square after another to get that whole uh, all 30 squares taken sequentially. This machine has multiple scanning beams in it. If you take off the cover, uh, that's what the underlying engineering is. A remarkable machine. It takes a electron source, puts it through a shower head, and basically turns it into 61 separate beams. And each of those beams scans a little box simultaneously. So you get 61 electron microscopes working at the same time. So this is one machine that has a 61-fold speed buildup. And, and the 61 is because the one in the middle is what makes the one. Uh, and it, you, if you have $5 million, you can get a slightly more uh, newer one that's 91 beams, uh, where there's still one in the middle. So this is what the images look like, this sort of hexagonal images. So each of these boxes get made at the same time. And then to generate a cubic millimeter, because this is only 100 microns, you tile these. And this is done automatically. You just have a stage that moves automatically to tile, let's say, a square millimeter. I've sped this up a little bit. What used to take five hours now can be done in five minutes. So that's a big speed up. And then you get images that look like this, sort of weird. Uh, and then you have to align them. This turns out to be a big issue because these images are extraordinarily large. And although this doesn't look aligned because they're jumping around, actually the nerve cells you see aren't moving at all. So we use uh, multi-core clusters to do this. Very sophisticated, very heavy computational challenges to do alignment. And then uh, if you just look at a little region like this, uh, this is what the data looks like. So now we're going to play. It's not a, it, it's a, space lapse. We're, we're playing through the EM data uh, of the aligned data. These are nerve cells. And then all these little things here, this is another nerve cell with its nucleus coming in, all this stuff moving around is just moving in space, objects that are moving at some direction relative to the cut of these images. It's fascinating uh, to look at. And you can already imagine that there may be a way you could just trace out all these wires, because you have enough resolution here to see everything. That's the nucleolus of a neuron. That's a blood vessel up there. If we zoom up a little higher magnification, now you'll see every single uh, synapse. You can follow these objects easily enough. And every once in a while, you'll see something filled with freckles. Uh, those are the synaptic terminals uh, that are filled with st stuff like that. And then you can just build a volume. Uh, here's a nuclear membrane with pores, nucleolus that's coming into field of view. It'll go out, and then other parts will come back in again. So this is very high resolution, just a small part of the volumes like this. So you end up with a box of brain, basically. A, you can have a cube like this, uh, where everything is rendered at 4 by 4 nanometers, and you're cutting at 30 nanometers. 
Uh, this is a very small data set, just two terabytes, but this is the kind of data set that uh, we started with. So when you have a data set like that, then you have to turn it into a wiring diagram. And one way to do this is just have a human being do it. A any child can do this. And now it turns out uh, computers can as well. So you, you color in uh, an object, like a dendrite, uh, in section after section. If you keep doing that, you can generate the three-dimensional version of that object going through uh, the data. So this is a dendrite with a bunch of spines. And there's an axon making synapses on two of those spines. So it works. Um, and that's good training data for uh, convolutional neural nets, uh, by the way, to get them to learn how to do this as well. So here is the vesicles in the axon uh, making a synapse on a dendritic spine. Of course, you don't just want to do two things. You want to do everything. So here is a data set where uh, this tool that Daniel Berger wrote, VAST, which is just sort of a digital coloring book, allows people to color in. So anyone who wants to do this, uh, we have an infinite amount of data that needs to be colored in. So if you like coloring and you want to do that for a living, uh, I can pay you minimum wage to color for as much as you want. So this is a, um, a red dendrite, a big apical dendrite of a pyramidal cell running right through the middle here. It'll come back that has spines coming off of it. And this was part of a paper where the purpose of the paper was just to ask, what is within a spine distance of a neuron? Since it has all these spines, what is there? What is in the brain within that distance? How many objects are there? We didn't really know. Uh, but after we did this, we did know. And it wasn't a pretty sight. So here are the uh, two dendrites we reconstructed with their spines. And these were not the only uh, dendrites that were in the volume. Of course, there's lots of other stuff pushed in there here. And that's the dendritic spine that sticks out the furthest. I'll come back to that in a second. Here are all the other dendrites of other nerve cells that are pushed in surrounding these two dendrites. So their spines now are, hard, are just barely visible. The dendrites, of course, are only part of the nervous system. There have to be axons as well. Turns out we found uh, about eight times more axons in this volume than dendrites. Here are all the axons. Now, I know this looks impossible. How can that and that be the same place? Don't they bump into each other? But wherever you see a dendrite, uh, there's no axon. So everywhere there isn't axons, uh, dendrites, there's axons. And there's more axons than dendrites, interestingly. And there's also supporting cells called glia. And there's all the glia. That's in there, too. So that's everything. And there, peeking out, is that little green dendrite. And then this, uh, an exploded view, just gives you a sense of what's in there. And I, I like to say this is either depressing or very depressing. I, I don't know what else to say about this. The insane number of things squeezed in to this very, very small area, which is a trivially small part of the brain. This is about one trillionth of a mouse brain. This also took us five years to reconstruct. So I don't, I'm not going to do the math about that. But in there were an extraordinary number of objects. And we could classify them. There were many types of axons. There were some that were myelinated, some that were inhibitory, some that were excitatory. There were oligodendrocytes, um, spiny dendrites, smooth dendrites, a different type of neuron. And embarrassingly, a bunch of things that didn't look like anything we'd ever seen before. And some of these are still, un we're unclear what they are. Even though we could trace them very long distances, they never really declare themselves as something that we've seen in the textbooks. So there are some you know, deep mysteries there. But from this, we learned a number of things. I'm not going to go through the details, except to say that we now have a tool that allows us to see everything. Every synaptic vesicle, these little white dots, are the synaptic vesicles in every axon's synapse on every dendritic spine is visible. And so this is good news. And I'm just going to end by saying where we're taking this. Now that we can do this, we should do cortical circuits. And we have decided to do cortical circuits of human brain, of human tissue that is taken from living humans who, for one reason or another, have to give up a little brain to have a medical procedure. So it's extremely well-preserved tissue, but it's from people who are walking around. And it allows us to get 
uh, cortical of humans, the cor cortex of humans. The neurosurgeons say, we're going to give you just a little piece. I say, of course. You know, I don't want to give me a lot. They give us pieces that are the size of a mouse brain. This is really disturbing to me. <laughs> that we can give up a mouse brain worth of brain and still be OK. <laughs> but apparently, there's large parts of the brain where neurosurgeons say, yeah, they can do what they want. It doesn't really change. <laughs> So the data set that we're working on right now is so big uh, that we fortuitously, uh, I got a call from uh, Varen Jain at Google, and he said, you have a big project. I said, do I have a big project? And so we have a piece of human uh, cerebral cortex that's very big. This is three millimeters by two millimeters. I know for you, that doesn't seem so big. But for us, that's big. This is 751,000 pixels by 500,000 pixels. So this image, this one image, these are nerve cells here, is 375 gigabytes. That means three of these images is a terabyte, and we have 5,000 of them. So it's 1.85 petabytes. That's 1,850 terabytes, or 1.8 billion megabytes. So it is a lot of data. It all has to be aligned, and then it all has to be segmented. And uh, Varain and his colleagues have taken this very seriously. And just yesterday, they sent me the first segmentation done entirely by artificial uh, neural networks. Uh, and it's a little piece of this, but they are going to do the entire cortex all the way through, all the layers. Uh, and I just couldn't help myself, since they had already done a few hundred sections, to reconstruct some of it. This all just came right out of their stuff without just some training from us. Uh, and in there were beautiful axons making synapses on spines uh, where no human being did this. This was done entirely by uh, computational tools. So this is fully automated rendering of human cortical circuits via artificial neural networks. And you've got to wrap your head around that a little <laughs> bit. What does that mean? I, what is, where are we going? <laughs> this is very disturbing. And I think I just want to end uh, with what has transformed in my lifetime. So information and understanding, uh, I think, have always been tied together. Scientists always say, I'm doing these experiments to understand something. And the great complexity problem coming at us is that when I was young, we had lots of really great ideas, big ideas and nothing got in the way. We had a lot of pseudo understanding, but there was nothing over here to tell us whether we were right or wrong. That was the way it was, and this is the way it is now. We, we are now generating extraordinary amounts of information, and it seems to me that the biggest casualty of all this big data may be big ideas, and that we're gonna have to come up with another way to deal with this extraordinary explosion of information and that it may not boil down to an idea as simple as synapse elimination. Maybe it will. In my mind, it seems reasonable. But as I said, if it seems reasonable, almost certainly it's not the right answer. What is the right answer? I don't know. But this is the philosophical problem of our time, which is sort of how to leverage information without trying to turn it into linguistic words. Are there models that we can use that we may never understand in the linguistic sense of being able to explain it, but they work? So, I'm going to end with that and just remind you I did very little of this. I have many, many colleagues uh, who I've worked with, many collaborators, uh, and support from many sources because this is very expensive work. And I'm happy to take questions if you have any. <clears throat> Not to make it even more difficult, but have you looked? Uh, uh, intra, at intrauterine mice uh, brains to actually see how the brain developed from you know very limited connections to the high density of connections at birth and then obviously the pruning afterwards? Uh, we looked in muscle at earlier stages than birth. And you may remember that it peaked at birth. In fact, things are simpler before birth and then they get a peak at birth. But before birth, you're still making synapses. You're just sort of building the nervous system. So it's simple 
not so much because there isn't fan in and fan out. There's just not, not a lot of cellular elements yet. The cortex is a very complicated tissue in that it, there are waves of development for different parts of the brain, different layers of the brain mature at different times. So at some point, of course, I mean, going back to babies, I, I'd like to do human babies. It's hard enough to get adult tissue. It's very hard to imagine getting uh, good quality human baby tissue. So I, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. But we are definitely, I, for me, I, ha I have to do the adult first to know if a baby's different. If I, if I do a baby without knowing what the adult looks like, I won't be able to be very informed. So we have to start with the adult. But I agree with you. We have to go back to birth and then perhaps even before birth. I'm assuming if these are things related to experience, then it really gets going after birth. That those first nine months, there's some kicking in the womb for humans and other animals. They do some motor development before birth. But I have a feeling for mammals especially and humans, it's what happens after birth that really matters. So you would say that birth means that when the organism gets exposed to outside stimulus besides the womb and the mother in that? Yeah, that's what I would say. Is that where the line comes in with your, um, your chart or your diagram? That is where that peak was, was the day of birth. It was amazing. The day of birth was the most complicated the muscle system is. Uh, so, uh, you talked about artificial neural networks a little bit, uh, and so I'm curious from your point of view, because I have a computer science background, uh, what are the main similarities between the artificial neural networks that we use nowadays in machine learning? And uh, another question, uh, maybe related, um, uh, say we are able to overcome all the computational difficulties and we can uh, map the whole brain. Uh, would this be useful in any way to simulate a human being? And is that, in your opinion, possible in the future? I mean, the technical question about how artificial neural networks are different from natural neural networks, when we prune to zero, that connection is gone and can't come back. In most networks, there's an architecture that allows the weight to be anywhere from zero to one. But there's nothing, uh, z zero is not a one-way street. Th that is, it's just one of the states. In, in humans and in other animals, the zeros actually simplify the network tremendously. So that at the end, there's not as many competing voices deciding what to do. And that's why you, know, you, you may not trust a baby at uh, two years of age alone in a house because they're going to maybe try to stick a fork in the plug because that's interesting. There's a hole and I've got something with forks in it. Whereas you'll trust a two-year-old dog because they're, they're not that curious anymore by two. Maybe a two-month-old dog you wouldn't trust alone, but a two-year-old dog you would. So I don't know, you know at what point artificial networks will start to try to think about this. Maybe the people are already doing this, to simplify the network by culling out of the network, uh, the, the layered network, things that aren't working so that there's no wasted time going through the zeros anymore. That would be like pruning. The other thing is that in actual neural networks, there's a huge amount of recurrent uh, connectivity. So for example, the retina goes to the thalamus, and the thalamus goes to the visual cortex. That's the way information flows in. But the number of axons going from visual cortex to thalamus is 10 times greater than the number of axons going from retina to thalamus. So the back propagation direction is, is bigger than the forward one. And I'm not sure in neural networks that there is anything like that yet. Uh, and then what could we make a human being in silico? Is that what you're saying? Many people think so. Ken Hayworth. Uh, who helped make the Atom device, who's at Genelia Farm, I think believe that uh, the only way humans will ever communicate with people or sentient beings on other places is by sending the wiring diagram at the speed of light, broadcasting it into space, and having the person recreated at the other end, at least their brain recreated. Now, that sounds very fanciful, but 
Maybe. I don't know. Uh, so, most brains are looks very complicated, like uh, many animals. But I remember 50 years ago, Sidney Bradner studied, uh, began studying C. elegans, symbol worms, and it has uh, just a few hundred cells. Uh, I think he started to understand the neural system of this world, and I think it's failed. No, I'm no. just, no, no, <laughs> just wondering how understanding on the simple yeah. animals like worms. So first of all, I would never call a worm a simple animal. I would but call just... it a hyper-evolved animal that has managed to get all of its behaviors with only 300 nerve cells. That's not easy. That requires maybe a billion years of evolution. So it's an extremely complicated nervous system because every nerve cell has extraordinary tricks that are different from every other nerve cell. It's one of the hardest nerve cell animals to figure out. And I know because with Aravi Samuel, we are doing every developmental stage of C. elegans. We'll be publishing a paper in a few months on that work. And it's interesting, but it is not simple. And, and every time people talk about C. elegans as a simple organism, I say, you want to see simple? Look at the brain of a human being where you have the same nerve cell over and over and over again. You just have little variations in the wiring, but it's just a very redundant nervous system. It's like the difference between a Nintendo chip you know, that's been made for one very specific purpose and a generic computer that can learn anything. This is a simple brain. If we come into the world much less fit than a worm, a worm doesn't have to learn anything. It's all built in. That's a lot harder. We just have one algorithm, a learning algorithm. Nobody understands it, but that's, that's it. Whether it comes in through your eyes or your ears, it wires you up. That's simple in my mind. So I, I, and when people say to me, why are you working on a hard animal as opposed to a simple animal? I say, I'm working on a big animal with a lot of redundancy as opposed to a little animal where every single thing is an exception based on evolution. But no one would say it failed who really works in that area. They use that connectome a lot. It's just there have been some naysayers who just don't like the notion that we should actually describe wiring diagrams. So they say it's worthless. You know, it's like saying there's no point in using the Hubble telescope because it's worthless. There's just so much stuff out there you'll never make sense of it. No one would say that about astronomy or people who do archaeology and find new dinosaurs. It's worthless because there's so many different kinds of dinosaurs. But when it comes to brains, it's worthless. We don't want to look. I just, I'm sorry, you see I'm a little more. <laughs> I have fought this fight so many times. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I wonder what your thoughts are on uh, going from the static image to sort of modeling dynamics of uh, kind of flowing, information flowing through the system. So there are two kinds of dynamics. You know, there's the dynamics of the actual flow of information through these wiring diagrams, which you don't get from these static images. In fact, most of that stuff is initiated based on information coming from the sensory world which is not in the nervous system, but it's in the world that is driving it. The ideas you have based on what you just heard or saw, or saw, that's invisible. And that's a profound problem. But anything you've memorized, anything you know, must somehow be instantiated in those wires. How, nobody knows. But there is a trace, an engram, of the activity patterns, the experiences you've had, that is somehow embedded in those wiring diagrams in mammals, I believe. The other kind of dynamics that a lot of people say is, well, the nervous system is constantly changing. You're learning new things. And I said, well, as a baby, but as an adult, I said, well, and my colleagues said, well, I learn all the time. I said, yeah, I don't, you know. I, you know, when I thought of my parents, they didn't learn that much. I would tell them things that were really interesting. I'd say, oh, that's really interesting. Next time I'd see them, I'd have to tell them again. And it wasn't that they had Alzheimer's. It just went in one ear and out the other. They didn't care. 
And I think, so I don't think there's that much plasticity. I, I, and this is a very you know, extreme view, that plasticity in adults is hard. That guy spent eight months learning to ride a bicycle. You know, if it was that hard as a child, no one would learn to ride a bicycle. For adults to learn a new language, to learn to ride a bicycle, to do, for me to learn Twitter at this point, it's hopeless. <laughs> I can't, couldn't do it. Um, it's really profound uh, lecture. I, I was thinking about the, what you started out talking about, comparing um, casual, Ramon Casual and uh, Golgi. And, you know, I think in more contemporary ways that Golgi created this technology ability to see the anatomy. And, but, but uh, you know, Ramon de Casual came up with this crazy idea of showing directionality. In a way, would you say that what you're showing now is more analogous to Golgi? <laughs> and if so, what, where, where do you think the possible entry points are for creative uh, work on this? Yeah, so Cajal's genius was to come up with an idea that was simple enough that everyone could understand. And those ideas have real power. The fact that we're now 140 years later, if you ask me to draw a neural circuit for you, I'll draw it in a Cajalian way with these arrows. It is very profoundly easy to think about it that way. I think the truth of the matter is that it is much more complicated than that simple-minded idea. There is a lot more, for example, local interactions. I didn't actually show much neurobiology data, but we have just finished reconstructing a nerve cell in the thalamus. It's called a local interneuron, and it's inhibitory. And every single process is both an axon and a dendrite. Every process both sends information and receives information and works locally. It's not collecting information and sending it out the axon. It's doing local circuit motifs everywhere along its branches, and it has thousands of synapses. That's, that doesn't fit the Cajal worldview, but it's definitely in the nervous system. So yeah, I th you know, Golgi, I think, got a bad rap because it turned out there is a kind of synapse called electrical synapses, where cells are just connected to each other in a syncytium. That's what he said. It was just a diffuse neural network. There's no directionality. Information can flow both ways. There are synapses like that. He, he was not, you know, he was clearly a great scientist. He got a Nobel Prize. I mean, he just wasted his Nobel lecture. I would say that's the only thing he did wrong. He should have bragged about what he did rather than argue the other way. All right, I might cut the discussion short at okay. that point. So. Thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you here next time. And please join me in thanking Jeff once again. Very much.